Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, with Thanksgiving coming up soon, in a couple of weeks, uh, I decided we're going to take a break from COVID. What's the matter? Well, with Thanksgiving coming up next week, <laughs> I, I mean, well, how am I supposed to know what's going on around here? <laughs> but we're still taking a break from COVID because, you know, I'm sick of it. Uh, but let's talk about bird flu. Let's talk about things that can kill you. I mean, you know, they can infect you. So we're up to now 53 cases of H5N1, uh, mostly from infected dairy cattle and dairy cattle workers in California, a other uh, group of uh, poultry workers in Washington State and as I uh, mentioned last week there's been a new case of a, a person uh, in Canada who got uh, a teenager who, who came down with H5N1 it's really interesting because that that patient well interesting and sad that patient's very ill a uh, critical condition and he does not have the version of H5N1 that is circulating in dairy cattle he has the one that is circulating in wild birds and the poultry industry that's sort of been infecting Washington State. The interesting thing is they don't have any known exposure, so no one really knows how he got infected. He does have a bunch of pets around, but they were all tested negative. So it's, it's not uh, known how he got infected, but it's a big concern, big concern, because this is the first case of someone who's really critically ill from H5N1 from the wild bird strain, not the dairy cattle strain. Uh, so this is a, this is a concern and uh, the Canadian health officials are trying to do more surveillance uh, to look at the, not only the bird population, but they haven't reported any infection in dairy cattle in Canada yet. So they're gonna start looking at that. If you look at how much, it, it, it's a huge problem in animals. 10,000 wild birds have been uh, shown to have H5N1. 108 million poultry now, 549 dairy herds in 15 states with outbreaks. So again, I, I, in my own personal view, there ought to be thinking about vaccinating industry workers and, and dairy cattle. Now, uh, I wanted to bring up RSV. Uh, this is an important disease. This is the last several years from 2016 to 2023 when you see the peak of RSV infection. So. Generally, this, like 2022, 23, it started in a little earlier in December, but generally it's a January, February, and March. So RSV season is sort of creeping up on us. Uh, if you look at who's most uh, affected by it, it's those over the age of 75. They account for almost half of the hospitalizations. 20% of the patients who are hospitalized end up in the ICU and about one in 25 patients die. So. This is a real bad disease and if you're over the age of 65 or between over, over the age of 60, if you have any kind of complicating illness, hypertension, diabetes, whatever. So, uh, you know, I remind everyone, RSV is a vaccine preventable disease. That was a big stride. We just developed an RSV vaccine. A single dose of any licensed RSV vaccine is recommended for anybody over the age of 75 and for those over the age of 60, uh, if you're at increased risk, so between 60 and 74, if you're at increased risk for any other complicating disease, you should get a vaccine. There are three available, uh, GSK, Zorexi, uh, Moderna's M, Resvia, and Pfizer's Abrisvo. Uh, you can get them any time, but now is the best time to get them because the season's about to come up. Uh, so if, I, if you haven't been in RS, you got an RSV vaccine and you're over the age of 60, you should certainly consider it. Over the age of 75, you should definitely get it. Uh, and, you know, right now, it is not considered an annual vaccine. So anyone who got an RSV vaccine last year doesn't need to get one this year. But if you haven't gotten one and you're in that category, please get one. This is a preventable disease and very severe in the elderly. Well... I haven't talked about MPOX for a while, but we had our first case of clade one MPOX. So let me remind you, it's a pox, uh, MPOX is, is a, a pretty serious disease. You can see the lesions, they look like chicken pox or small pox with poxes. Uh, clade one is the one that's in Central Africa. That's a very serious Ill, illness. Clade two is in West Africa, and that's the... Uh, and that's a much less severe disease. Clade 2 is the one that had the outbreak in 2022 and 23 in the United States. 
Uh, it's pretty much all over the country now, clade 2, but the real concern was we had the first case of the severe form of mpox, clade 1, in the United States. Uh, this was from a person who traveled from Central Africa, so there was probably a travel exposure. Uh, there have been no additional cases reported. Uh, you have to have very close personal contact, so it's mostly uh, sexually transmitted. But in Africa, it's because people live in close quarters and they're constantly in contact. Uh, there is a vaccine available for those who, are, uh, who need it or who are eligible. If you look at clade one, mostly in the part of, part of Africa I showed you, but there are other countries now that have reported one or a couple cases. The very first case outside of Africa for clade one was a Swedish traveler who came back from traveling to Africa. And since then, there have been individual cases that, uh, from people traveling from Central Africa to Thailand, India, and Germany. As I mentioned, the U.S. has one now. The United Kingdom reported four cases of people in a, one family. And uh, in countries that have not had that particular clade one mpox, uh, Zambia and Zimbabwe are now as, uh, reporting cases of people who traveled from the, uh, the DRC. Now, I wanted to spend some time talking about measles and vaccine coverage, because this is a real important topic. And there was just a recent paper that reported that less than 93% of kindergartners now are vaccinated with the vaccines that are considered important for, uh, for good health. MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella, diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, polio, and varicella, or, or, or chickenpox. Uh, it was at 95% down to 93%. Uh, it, what's also happening is there are more and more families asking for exemptions and being granted exemptions up from 3% to 3.3%. But that's on a national average. There are some states where exemptions exceed 5%. I'm going to explain why that's not good. But there are basically 280,000 school children who are unvaccinated and unprotected for measles. In this paper that they reported, you can see that uh, the exemptions are going up dramatically since 2021-22. Vaccine coverage is very spotty in the United States. There are some states that have high coverage, over 95%, between 95 and 98%, the dark blue. But in the light blue states, it can be much, much less. Uh, and so why is that important? Measles is actually a very severe disease. Uh, in the, when the vaccine was uh, licensed in 1963, it was really hailed because there were so many problems with kids getting measles, serious measles, dying, getting, encep getting encephalitis. And you can see it, the introduction of the vaccine went from 500,000 cases to virtually very few. By 1989, because there were a couple of blips, they recommended a second dose. Uh, and in 2000, uh, measles was declared by the CDC eliminated. That is, until people stopped getting vaccinated. And so because of this reluctance to be vaccinated, you know, what happens is people haven't seen a measles case. So they go like, oh, it's not a problem. Well, it's a real problem. We had 371 cases uh, in 2018, uh, 1,200, and in this year so far, 8,277 cases. And you can see these are individual cases. Uh, we're getting more and more. And I'm gonna, we're gonna do some stuff. Hold on, Janet, we're gonna do some science. Remember we talked about that R number, the R zero number, the calculation. It, that's, that tells you how infectious a virus is. So it, the R number uh, specifies the average number of secondary infections produced by one person. So if you're infected and you see a bunch of uh, people who are susceptible, how many people do you infect? If the number is greater than one, you tend to have an epidemic outbreak. If the number is less than one, then it tends to die out. So in other words, if I just infect less than one person, it's not going to be a big epidemic. But if I infect two people, it's a big one. And so if you look at that's sort of how we gauge infectivity. Infectious, it, it's, it's determined by what that R number is. And so you can see these are examples. Uh, the orange is a primary infection. The purple is a secondary infection. So in hepatitis or Ebola, one person infects two. And you do have epidemics. HIV, one person infects four. SARS, it, when this paper was published, it was four. The R number has now gone up to 10. But the most infectious uh, virus is measles. So one person can infect 18 people. 
And so this is the R number plotted as you go higher and higher. You can see uh, rotavirus and measles, whooping cough are the most infectious. COVID started off in four, but as it mutated, it got more and more infectious and is now about 10. So why is that important? Well, when you think about how do you prevent infections from spreading in to all over the country and being an epidemic, it's what you have to develop herd immunity through either vaccination or getting, uh, getting the virus. So, the amount of herd, the amount of people that need to be protected from the virus determines uh, how, whether or not you prevent epidemic spread or not. And that is calculated, herd immunity, which is when you, the virus will not spread spontaneously, is calculated by one minus one over the R number. So if the R number is two, you only need 50% of the population to be protected either through vaccination or having been infected. In measles case, the R number is 18. So that means you have to have 95.5% of the population vaccinated to prevent outbreaks. If it's not, so when I mentioned before, the paper showed that they were down to 93%, you can very easily predict there will be outbreaks of measles. And where will those outbreaks take place? They'll take place where there's low vaccination rates. And that's what we're seeing. So this is a completely preventable disease through vaccination and people are being reluctant to get vaccinated, it's now fallen below the amount you need for herd immunity. So you can just anticipate we will begin to see more and more measles outbreaks and there will be serious complications and there'll be some children who die from this disease that's totally preventable. So get your kid vaccinated for measles and be sure that you're immune. Well, I mentioned last week also influenza season is upon us. This is what it looked like last year. You can see the uptick. Well, this is us now. It's just starting. If you haven't gotten your flu vaccine, get it now. If you look at what, uh, what are the subtypes of the virus, it's mostly uh, influenza A, H1N1, and H3N1. Those are in the vaccine, so it's a good match this year. Uh, once again, if you haven't gotten your uh, flu vaccine, get that. If you haven't gotten your COVID vaccine, get that. RSV for anybody over the age of 60s, and if you have kids, please get their measles vaccines. Make sure before you send kids to school that they have measles resistance. So I want to end today with a couple of shout outs. First of all, the American Liver Foundation announced eight winners of the 2024 Pilot Research Awards that fund highly innovative projects on liver disease. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Sanjeev Harpavat, Associate Professor of Pediatric Gastroenterology who's based at Texas Children's and Dr. Krupa Mysore, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Gastroenterology, for their research projects focused on infants with biliary atresia. Uh, congratulations to Dr. William Culp, Associate Dean of Faculty Affairs and Faculty Development for the School of Medicine on the Temple campus, who was recognized with the Distinguished Educator in Anesthesiology Award for the American Society of Anesthesiologists. That award uh, acknowledges individuals who made a significant contribution to the advancement and sharing of, of anesthesia knowledge. And of course, Thanksgiving is coming up. So next week, we will uh, be releasing our video on Wednesday. So it won't be Happy Friday, it'll be Happy Wednesday. And of course, we will have a very special Thanksgiving message from both me and from Lily. So have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next Wednesday.